There are things that ordinary people can use to detect when somebody's lying to them. Yes, the most important thing is to look for something that's not their typical, something that's off the baseline, that can be in business, kids, your marriage, it doesn't matter, it goes all the way across the line. Pamela Meyer, one of the foremost experts, if not the foremost expert in lie detection, deception detection. The average person, I think, has no idea how much lying goes on and how able they are to spot that. So how much do people lie? Well, we lie a lot. I mean, some studies say we lie up to 200 times a day. Some studies say we lie only five times a day. The way I break it up is there are high stakes lies and low stakes lies. And so we navigate social dignity all day long with white lies. Honey, you don't look fat in that. You know, that's okay. Or, you know, oh, I'm sorry, I just fished that email out of my spam folder. Not a problem. The high stakes lies are less common, but they're very high stakes and they're significant. So yeah. lies like, you know, that affect maybe who to marry or what house to buy or who to go to work with and so forth. Those are very high stakes lies that we have to really avoid. Is there a list of things that cause people to lie? Because you say people lie, you say as many as 200 times a day. What are the motivators? What cause people to lie? You know, first of all, everyone lies. And so it's really important to understand what motivates someone to lie. If you want to get to the truth, you have to understand their motivation. For the most part, we lie to avoid conflict. We lie sometimes to manipulate someone, to have power over someone. We lie to gain the admiration of others. We lie oftentimes to protect privacy. So not all lies are necessarily for terrible reasons. There are times when somebody will lie simply to gain power over another person or to manipulate the situation, but they're kind of offensive and defensive lies, and not all of them are terrible. One of the things that I have focused on from a psychological standpoint is empathy, warmth, and genuineness. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between being genuine and being cruel. Like, for example, let's say a guy goes up to a girl in a club and says, would you like to dance? She can say, no. That's genuine. She doesn't want to dance. Or she could give a fulsome answer and say, I wouldn't dance with you <laughs> in a hundred years if you were the last <laughs> man on earth. You smell funny. You look funny. I would drop dead first. That's also the truth. But is that a lie by omission to leave all of that out? No, not at all. I mean, you're having a dinner party and the one person who sucks all the air out of the room and dominates the whole thing calls you up and says, I heard you're having a dinner party. Oh, I'm so sorry. I must have the wrong email address. You still got to probably invite them to the dinner party. Yeah. So there's there's social dignity and there's appropriate boundaries in the world. And honestly, a lot of people use the excuse of authenticity as a way to act in very aggressive ways towards each other. And I don't think it's helpful to anybody. Yeah, that's an interesting term, social dignity. What do you mean by that? Well, everyone's trying to make their way in the world and yeah. we all make mistakes and we all have conflicts and it's a complicated world. And sometimes you have a bad day. Sometimes you have a good day. It's sort of like driving on the highway. You have to kind of navigate around the challenges. And oftentimes that requires a slight bit of fabrication in order to do that. Yeah. It does help people's feelings, right? You're protecting their feelings. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I get it. I've been bald since I was 12. I read a study the other day that said men, 78% of men would cut a body part off rather than be bald. <laughs> <laughs> and I have people say, oh, listen, I, I get being bald. That wouldn't bother me at all. I'm thinking, no, I read a study that said 78% <laughs> of you would cut something off before you would be bald. Yeah, no, I don't lie to me. Now, I wrote down some of the things that you said that I have quoted so many times, and I've just been dying to ask you about these things. You say men lie eight times more about themselves, whereas women lie to protect others. Yeah, there's some science around that. I mean, men, you know, you've just met somebody, they were on Match.com or a dating service, you're on your first date. He says, oh, yeah, I was VP of sales at that company. Well, he may have been director of sales or manager of sales. They oftentimes yeah. do it for position. They're kind of pre they're viewing themselves as they're presenting themselves a little bit higher up than they really were. 
women oftentimes will protect other people's feelings and they'll try to avoid conflict. But we do lie with equal frequency. And when people lie on resumes and that sort of thing where they kind of fluff things up, do people expect to get caught or do you think they think they're going to get away with it? So this is an interesting question. There is a small percentage of people for whom you have the what were you thinking question. Like, of course, you're a C-suite executive. You're going to go through an executive search firm. Why on earth did you say you were CFO when you weren't? Yeah. So that's a small percentage of people where there's really a disconnect between reality and what one could expect. For the most part, though, I think people just fabricate a little bit to boost themselves up a little bit. You know, one study was done where they looked, I think it was Career Builder who did the study. They looked at fabrication in resumes. And do you know what one of the most common resume lies was? Claiming to be a member of the Kennedy family. You're so, kidding. No. So, I mean, <laughs> what were they thinking? <laughs> Why would you want to be a member of <laughs> know, the Kennedy exactly. family? Exactly. Let's right. think well. Capaquitic. Let's think, uh, <laughs> well, you uh, get the interview. Yeah. <laughs> I always hear people say, uh, particularly to their teenagers, why do you lie? You never get away with it. Isn't the truth that they get away with it most of the time? People don't lie if they're not getting away with it, right? That's true. But particularly with teenagers, and you know this, of course, from your show, we do so much to avoid embarrassment. We will go to such lengths to avoid being confronted. And particularly now when we live in a digital world where people aren't used to being confronted in person, we'll go to any length. There's a saying in Texas, for every rat you see, there's 50 you don't. The number one predictor of future behavior is not some psychological test. It's not an MMPI. It's not a Rorschach. It's, it's not any of those tests. I always had people asking me the question, and I would say, look, if you want to know if this candidate's going to steal from you, the best thing you can do is get a really good history. If they stole from the last person they worked for, that's the best predictor of whether they're going to steal from you or not. Not some test. I always talk to people, and if they're lying to me about one thing or two things or three things, I always assume there's 50 things I'm not seeing that they're lying about. I just don't understand why people assume that the only lie they catch them in is the only lie they've told. Well, you know, it even goes deeper than that, because there's studies out there that show that people who start cheating in high school are much more likely to be fraudulent later on in life. Really? So we have to get it earlier and earlier and earlier. You're absolutely right. I mean, where there's smoke, there's fire usually. Yeah. I always think sometimes that parents teach their kids to lie because they put them in a position that they have to lie. It's like, you're going to tell me what I want to hear or your whole world's going to turn to hell. So they teach them to tell them what they want to hear. And so they've learned, okay, I can't avoid accountability if I'll tell you a white lie. And then it goes with them from there on. Now, with what accuracy can you spot a lie? If you're really trained in this, somebody you yourself or somebody you've trained to really look for the clusters, with what accuracy can you spot if somebody is truly weaving a story? So we know that with training, someone who's at like 54% accurate, can actually get to about 90% accurate if they're trained well. But I don't recommend that. I actually think even if you're the best human lie detector on earth, you should still be combining that with getting your facts and really confirming sources, going back to original sources, doing your research, talking to everybody that you can. Because the last thing you want to do is make the wrong assumption. Right. So, But you can, you can get pretty accurate. I mean, you can learn to observe facial microexpressions, look at people's verbal and nonverbal expressions, raise the cognitive load, as we say on someone, as you're asking them a hard question so that they start to show those tells a little bit yeah. more extensively. So what can people use to spot a lie if they're talking to a salesman, if they're talking to a coworker, God forbid they're suspicious of their spouse? What are the tells? What do they look for to see if somebody's really lying? Well, first of all, if it's someone they're working with, they're starting out in the right place because you have to, as you know, baseline someone first. You got to get, how are you? How was your weekend? Did you go shopping? What are you doing? You got to get a sense of their vocal tone, the cadence of their voice, their posture, their physical gestures. So you have to get someone's norm so you have a reliable reference point for measuring it later. So you always baseline someone. You get the norm first if it's a salesman or if it's someone that you don't know. If it's someone you know well, you know their baseline. You even know their go-to phrase when they lie. Right. But 
beyond that, there are two ways to do it. One is to ask a whole bunch of open-ended questions. Don't threaten the person at all and just let them start talking. And you can observe verbal and nonverbal indicators. Clearly on the verbal side, the ones that we're most familiar with that you hear all the time are when someone says, you know, to tell you the truth in all honesty, this house I'm trying to sell you, did the basement flood? Let me think about that one more time. Repeating the question. I no, no it didn't flood. Okay. You're not buying that house. Yeah. And so if someone's repeating the question, offering up qualifying language, using perhaps what we say, distancing language, like saying it, like Bill Clinton said, I didn't have sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky, right. uh, narrowing the field a little bit. I didn't take 20 from that drawer, not, hey, I never stole anything in my life. Using maybe soft replacement language. Oftentimes, you know, if you're, when law enforcement interviews a potential rapist, He's going to say, I didn't touch that woman, not I didn't rape that woman. They use soft replacement language. Uh, normally, though, what I find most effective on the verbal side, because all of that's pretty hard to track if you're living out in the middle of, you know, you're doing your job every day and you're busy. And you, I don't know if that was distancing language or not. That's right. pretty hard to track. Here's the shortcut. Did the person across the table from you that you're asking questions of just subtly shift from very cooperatively providing you with information to what we call convince mode. Are they all of a sudden starting to try to persuade you of their truthfulness, bolster their character in some way? But I'm a good person. I went to a good school. I'm honest. I go to church every Sunday. When they try to bolster their character and they're starting to plead and convince you. And before that, they were just providing you with information. That's a pretty good flash and yellow light. Yeah, they start making convincing statements. Exactly. Everybody will tell you. Right. I give more money than was stolen. I, I donate more money than was taken. Exactly. I say, forget all those indicators. It's, you do need to find two or three on the verbal side, two or three on the nonverbal side. But throw all that out for a minute and ask yourself, is that person just trying to convince you? Are yeah. they starting to plead more and more desperately? That's a red light. Is it an indicator that you look at if somebody, if you ask them, what do you think should happen to a person that's done this if they mitigate the consequences? Very much so. So there are a bunch of questions you can ask that are kind of telltale questions that'll provoke somebody and they'll help you get to the truth. And if you say, what should happen to whoever deflated those footballs, Tom Brady? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. He, he, if you say, what should happen to whoever stole that computer? The guilty person's going to say, I, I don't know. It's not my job to say. They're going to look down. Maybe probation. I don't know. The honest person's going to say, you kidding? Kick them out of the game, fire them, bring in law enforcement. Let's get to the truth. So strict punishment is typically recommended by the truthful person. Yeah. And if they're guilty, they're going to say, well, you know, yeah, they're going to yeah. Yeah, waffle around. It's actually interesting because when you think about lying, the reason we're really bad lie detectors is because we don't usually find out if someone lied or we don't find out until much later. So we have a learning curve problem. It's not like tennis where you serve a ball yeah. and you get instant feedback, the ball went out of the court. It's probably the same thing if you're a blackout drunk, right? You don't know what you didn't know. Yeah. You don't know what may have happened. So if you are, and I'm not accusing of being a blackout drunk or even a fragmented blackout drunk, but I'm saying if you happen to be a fragmented or a blackout drunk, there are probably lots of times where no one ever told you you blacked out and you don't know yeah. you did. So it's complicated. Well, should people, should parents... Should small business owners go to the trouble to try to learn at least the rudimentary skills of lie detection, lie spotting? I think they should, and I'll tell you why. It's not like we're going to run out and we're going to go, liar, liar, pants on fire. Let's point the finger at everybody out there. But think about it. You study piano. You study clarinet. You study violin. And what happens? You develop a much greater appreciation for music. You study lying and you start to understand it, it imparts in you an appreciation for who to trust. And that's significant. And it can really change your life. If you really start to think through where should your relationships be? Who's important to trust? How do you want to build the infrastructure of trust around you? That's significant. So it's really not about learning the tells. It's really about thinking through what role is trust going to play in your life and how are you going to create that circle of trust around you that's going to give you the support that you need. Dr. Phil here. Come February 27th, 
you're going to be able to pick up a book called We've Got Issues, and you know we do. This is a book that says it's going to teach you how to stand strong for America's soul and sanity. And in this book, I set forth 10 principles for saving this society from going off the deep end. 10 principles for protecting your family. 10 principles for giving you what you need to flourish and have the life that you want for yourself and for your children and for your grandchildren. We've taken some wrong turns. We've been letting the loudest voices dictate some of the thinking that has taken us way off course. Well, I'm speaking up and bringing us back to the center of the road. I hope you'll pick this book up and I hope you'll read it with a real open mind because I'm pushing back against a lot of what you've been hearing. Somebody had to do it, might as well be me. February 27th, we've got issues. You probably know them as the behavioral panel experts, and I'm talking about Scott Roush, Greg Hartley, Mark Bowden, and Chase Hughes. These guys are the absolute body language, nonverbal cue experts, and Scott, I'm going to introduce each of them individually, so this is going to go for a minute, and then we're going to talk. But he's a behavior analyst and body language expert. He's been involved in interrogation of terrorists. He's a cognitive neuroscience guy and really is an expert on getting to the truth, spotting deception with criminals. He holds multiple certificates in advanced interrogation training and has been trained alongside FBI, Secret Service, U.S. military, DOD, His extensive training and education and practice of nonverbal communication have made him the go-to guy, just expert and consultant to law enforcement as well as heads of companies uh, all over the country, attorneys, executives, they all look to him. He's also a Grammy-nominated producer based in Nashville and has the Nashville Entrepreneur Center where he heads the EC's pitch department and works with startups and new entrepreneurs. His body language Frankenstein presentations and talks have been educating and entertaining audiences nationally and internationally. Greg Hartley is an expert interrogator, and uh, you'll see what I mean when we get into it. He's a human behavior consultant and can speak to special ops, interrogation, terrorists, and criminals. He's worked and has honors with the United States Army, More recently, it has drawn organizations such as the Defense Intelligence Agency, Navy SEALs, federal law enforcement agencies. He's worked with national television. They seek his insights about how to as well as why. He's in Atlanta, Georgia. He's written seven books along with a co-author, Mary Ann Carnage. Mark Bowden is expert in body language and human behavior and communication and not just on reading people, but in telling people how to project what they want, to present themselves in a way to build trust and credibility. He was voted the number one body language professional in the world. He's very passionate about giving people the most influential and persuasive communication techniques they need to stand out and win over individuals or audiences, inspiring, energetic, engaging and really entertaining. He's done a lot of memorable talks. TEDx, he's got a great YouTube channel, reaches millions of people. He works with some of the top organizations in the world, Spotify, Dell, Viacom, Toyota, Walmart, Nestle, just all over the place. Chase Hughes is a behavioral science expert. He can speak to persuasion, profiling, nonverbal analysis, and deception detection You're just not going to get it past him. He's tops in interrogation. He's founder and CEO of Applied Behavior Research and is a leading behavior expert and author of the three-year number one best-selling book on persuasion, influence, and behavior profiling, the Ellipsis Manual. Now, he teaches military units, intelligence organizations. He's also been involved in one of my favorite things, which is jury selection, people reading, human intelligence, and 
He is also the creator of the Pre-Violence Indicators Index, which is designed to alert personnel to pre-attack behaviors. And this is something that really saves lives. He attended a military academy before joining the Navy in 98. He now lives in Virginia Beach, but he's got Texas roots, so that makes him near and dear to my heart. In other words, we're talking to the best of the best. There are so many myths out there that mislead people. I mean, they get some of this pop psych where, you know, somebody's lying if they're looking up to the left or right or, you know, blah, 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 blah. There are some things that people can look at to determine whether somebody is lying or whether they're not. One of the, one of the first things you're going to look for is are the differences in comfort and discomfort. That's, that's basically the bottom line there. And when you see someone going from comfort to discomfort, you're going to see things. We're all, we'll all cover different things about this, but I'll, I'll cover the adapters on this. And so what you'll see is that person who's becoming uncomfortable, as they try to get rid of some of this built-up stress and or tension, they'll start doing little things like, like this with their hand or they'll chew on their mouth, or they may just for a second push their lips together, not in, in the disappearing lips as, you know, or, or stress mouth, but you'll see things that they'll move their shoulders a little bit to try to almost massage themselves, or they will massage themselves. You'll see them push on their face, facial denting. And these things get rid of that built-up stress or tension. That's one of the first things, I think, out of the baseline we all start looking for. I'll take it a different path. Verbal and vocal cues. A person who tries to negotiate the question, or who tries to condition the question, or takes longer to get to yes or no, that's a good indicator that something is wrong. If they normally say yes or no, you ask them a complex question, they ramble before they say yes or no. That's distancing, verbal distancing. That's a great indicator. There are places where people hide time. I taught resistance interrogation and a good portion of it's tied to that. Things like saying, and then. It means I just jump over a period of time. Doesn't mean they're lying. It means that there's an opportunity for a lie there, an opportunity to miss something. And then word choice changes, how the sentence is structured. There's a ton of things in there we can teach, and we do try to walk on the show. And then the sound of their voice, cadence changes. If something blips, it's an indicator. You should pay attention when something changes because something's changing inside their little knot, and that's what's going on. Let me take it in this direction. So there are parts of your body that are probably more vulnerable than others. If you think about the carotid arteries, the windpipe, here and just under the armpits here and around the ribs here. They're not well protected. There's some delicate organs there that if they get damaged, you're probably in big trouble. So you notice when people start getting uncomfortable about what they're saying, you might see the chin drop in. We call that turtling because they're actually protecting this carotid artery and windpipe there. You'll see them tuck in here so they can't get attacked under here. Now, of course, we know, they know they're not being attacked by an actual physical object, but their instinct doesn't know that. Their instinct is just under threat and pressure, and it shows up as they protect some of those delicate organs. Chase, you've probably got another way you can take this. Yeah, and, and please keep in mind that there is no such thing as deceptive body language. What we're looking for is changes to baseline and things that indicate stress or fear. But And a lot of this stuff is very research-based. And I'll just give one really good one that I see very regularly, that the less pronouns a person uses in a statement or a response to a question, the more likely it is to be deceptive. And second, if, if they pause longer than they normally do in that conversation, then that's also very solidly backed by research, both of those things. Okay, give us an example of a statement that would use less pronouns and would cause you to red flag that statement. Sure. So if I ask somebody, what did you guys do after you left the office Wednesday? And he says, wrapped up about 5.30 went to the store, picked up some cigarettes, went to the club, had about 17 beers, went home, played the Xbox for about 15 hours, and went to bed. So that has zero pronouns in it. Okay, so you're saying that there's less personalization of the statement. They don't want to own the statement or be part of or own the actions. They're distancing from the actions. That's one of the theories. It's that and it sounds more technical language. So like if you read the instruction manual for a dishwasher, there's no pronouns in it. So right. that, that's the secondary theory for that. 
Well, and the other one that you'll notice is lack of illustrators, not using your hands to make your points, not using any kind of illustrator, sitting dead still. I see it on your show when guys are trying to get past something and their hands don't rise, they don't start talking, or they're not using their face to punctuate because they're not really telling you anything. They're just using words. People don't understand. Your body is going to respond. You can't control all the physiological responses. Something's going to give you away if you're feeling threatened, and you can't monitor all those things at one time. When people think, you know, I can study all this up, then I can be a good liar. Well, you might be a better liar, but nobody can control everything all the time, right? Well, you know, I've, I've been studying this instinctual response for a long, long time. And I did go and take a look at some Japanese monks who had trained themselves that under an ice cold waterfall, their temperature would not reduce. They wouldn't start shivering, essentially. And so this was an amazing thing because it's like, okay, so these people can control their instinct. Well, here's the thing. You couldn't surprise them. If you if you run up behind them and chuck an ice cold bu bucket of water over them, they start to shiver. If they knew that the trigger was coming, they could prepare. But if they don't know the trigger's coming, then they can't prepare and they're in the same sea as the rest of us. And that's what happens under stress and pressure. If you can put somebody on the right stress and pressure, they're not ready for it, their body will dissemble and they'll start informing you of what's really going on. Greg, Greg you had something to say. Yeah, this. yeah, there are two points. You talk about soft white underbelly in your dog but humans are the only creatures that walk around with it exposed. And so we need to create exoskeletons with our elbows and we're panicked and those kinds of things more than any other creature. And the second one I would say is if you know body language, it's not always a plus. I did a History Channel special back before Abu Ghraib broke where we took people in and interrogated them. And the way I broke one of the young women there was I educated her what I was looking for. And every time she would do it, I would say, and there you go, you're lying again. Oh, and there you go, you're lying again. Oh, and there you go, you're lying again. And she just finally said, Okay, I can't hide that, so I'll give up. Yeah, you just make them self-conscious about it at that point. And it magnifies because all that fight or flight then comes to the surface again and stuff starts leaking. And you're watching for all that and you're pointing out that fidget with the fingers, that adapter, or that her illustrators are out of sync with her, with her sentence. And they can't hide it anymore. And yeah. that's the one thing to look for. You could teach a whole body language course on just... Is that person hiding or protecting arteries or belly? And that could be just a one, if I had to give a one sentence description of this is how you read a person and it was an emergency, that would be it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, exactly that, Ch Chase. I pretty much designed all of my work on trust and credibility around the idea that we're upright hominids and we, we're descendant from ground dwelling mammals. If you think Darwin is correct, we're descendant from ground dwelling mammals that stood up on the plains of Africa, didn't take a day or so, took millions of years. And those upright hominids were now exposing their belly because there was an advantage to be able to see distance over the plains. I could see way ahead of time if a predator was coming or if a potential mate was coming or there might be food over there. I win an advantage. There's now a disadvantage. I'm not protected around that belly area. So now a lot of my thought has to go to, am I safe around here? Uh, do I want to let people know that I'm open, I'm unarmed, and I'm unprotected around there? So a lot of our behavior goes right back at, at least uh, five and a half million years, in my view. So it's old, old behavior. You can't stop it. You can countermeasure it. But even then, if I surprise you, you know, your chances are very, very low of being able to be deceitful if I can surprise you with the stress and pressure. So if I would add one thing to that, what I always say is our, our systems are really primitive. And Scott, you'll have a, an answer to this one over the amygdala. Our, our brains are designed to find threat and then to respond to that threat. And it doesn't matter, and I'm, I'll just say it the way I would usually say it, it doesn't matter if it's a tiger chewing your ass or your wife chewing your ass, you're gonna respond the same way. You're going to ramp up and you're gonna have all that adrenaline flow and you're gonna do something. And your thinking brain is going to turn off and you're gonna respond. That's why we say stupid things to people we love when we're in, a, in that kind of argument because that brain is primitive and it's taking over. So in an interrogation situation, you can create, come up with questions and, and design your questions to um, elicit that behavior. And once you see that behavior, 
as they start to protect them, them themselves as a person, as a human, then they start protecting themselves, not just physically, but emotionally. And what have I said? And, and them in their social, uh, how they look socially. So it's important to, to create questions and create your questioning or form your questioning around things that are going to pop off their fight or flight, get them a little, get them fired up and start, start moving around. What are some tips that people can take away that can give them the confidence to build their credibility, project the confidence, increase their persuasiveness in their communications when they're putting themselves out there? Yeah, so let me give you my number one, and I I basically built my career in this, around this, which is the biggest indicator, the biggest stimulus for another human being, that you are credible and you can be trusted, because that happens in their head immediately. Immediately as as you approach them, they're in their head going, how good is this person, do I think, for me? Do I think they're gonna be helpful to me? Are they a friend? Are they a threat, a predator? Are they a potential mate for me? And if they're none of those three, I'm indifferent to them. They don't really count for me at all. The biggest trigger for friend is open palm gestures at exactly navel height. Just open palm gestures, no tools, no weapons, nothing in my hands and exposing that belly area right at navel height. It even changes your tone of voice. You'll notice when I place my hands here, the tone of voice changes. You'll notice if I bring my hands up to chest type, which actually instantly pushes your heart rate and your breathing rate up, just because of the way the body's built it, the heart has to go harder to push the blood against gravity. You'll hear a slight intonation change to me. As I drop my hands down here, you get a very different intonation change. And that's not anything I'm putting on. My body naturally does that. So just open palm gestures, navel height. It's great for trust and credibility. Yeah, it's astounding. I talked before about primal and tucking in your chin and going into closed body position. That's read the same way with animals, right? You approach a dog that can be threatened if you go at him like this, but if you go open palms down, then the dog doesn't see you as a threat near as much as he would in any other posture you can present because that's not a posture from which you can mount an attack. So yeah. even that is a primal sort of communication. Well, especially with dogs, because dogs grew up around us. I mean, literally, they are, they evolved. They were domesticated with us. So we share um, we share limbic resonance. That's why we're around dogs. And just like you and, and Scott here and Greg and Chase, we all have dogs. And uh, and my guess is all of us at times go, God, that dog's really kind of human. Like that's like a real human being. Biologically, it's nothing like us at all. Exactly. Nothing like us whatsoever. The genetic difference is so huge in reality. But the limbic brain is very, very simple, uh, very similar. It has a social mammalian brain that grew up alongside us. So the triggers are really similar. And so we tend to call them out as human beings and go, they're really human. I'm sure dogs look at us and go, I think that's a dog. That's a dog just like me. I'm sure they don't think we're human. I'm sure they think we're kind of these odd, upright dogs in reality. I yeah, think one of the important so. things that we should that we should cover is how your brain gathers that information and that we're seeing in, in open palm gestures and, and the behavior we're seeing in people. We've got three parts of the brain that we usually that we always deal with when we're gathering information. You have the fusiform gyrus that's right in here and it's about a quarter inch in. And that's what collects all the little things you see in somebody's body language. Then you have the mid-temporal gyrus that's a little bit up, up this way, and that collects all the big moves, all the big body language moves. And then you, these two things, as they collect this information, send it back to a thing called the locus ceruleus. I know this is horrifically boring, but I think it's important we should go over So it sends it back to the locus ceruleus, and that's what gives you the gut feeling or the most powerful thing in the world, the women's intuition, because it starts sorting through this information and starts comparing it to everything you've ever dealt with before in your life or everything that's ever seen in other people that, that you've ever dealt with in every situation. That's why sometimes you'll bring someone home from the, you know, an old army buddy or someone from college or high school and you'll say, honey, this guy is my buddy from high school and, and you're going to love him and he's going to come over Saturday, we'll eat and watch a movie. So you all cook and eat and your wife loves him and he's the nicest guy in the world. You guys had the best time. And by the time it's over, you're nice, your wife's been really nice to him up this point. No sooner does it, as, as you're hugging the guy, oh man, it's good seeing you again, Phil, or whatever his name is, you know, and then you'd send him out the door. 
And the next thing you know, your wife turns to you. No sooner does the door shut than she looks at you and says, don't you ever bring that back in this house again. Do you understand me? And you say, well, what's wrong with him? He's one of my best friends ever. And she says, I don't know. There's something not right about him. That's because her locus ceruleus hasn't quite yet put that information together and given it to her. It'll come to her in the shower or when she's driving or something she's doing all the time. Her brain's just sitting there and her body's doing something. But that's where that information is gathered. And that's where that, that female uh, woman's intuition comes from. And we, and as men, we get a gut feeling. That's, I think that's an important part of, of what we're talking about, the neurological aspect of it. Yeah. Sure. Yep. And what's fascinating is that that's that mammalian brain that's down there processing this stuff is incapable of human language. So it can't send us a text message and say, well, the blink rate went up. He started doing this. He covered his groin when he was talking about his credit score or whatever. But it, it's an emotion communicator. So the gut feeling cannot come through in English because it's been doing that for so right. long. And when it gets, gets a trust and credibility, if there's one thing that fear makes our bodies do is it, it speeds them up. If you look how fast a chihuahua moves when there's a sound in the house versus how fast a Rottweiler moves in response, the, the more scared animal moves quicker. So even if we're with somebody and we're start moving quicker, we're blinking faster, our hands are moving faster, that's sending that subconscious signal, just exactly what Scott was talking about, that maybe we shouldn't be trusted, that maybe, I, maybe I'm a little bit less trustworthy. So if anyone's trying to build trust or credibility, this truth pain thing is, is absolutely fantastic. And I would do the exercise of never move faster than if you were standing in a swimming pool. And make that your go-to if you're in sales or speaking to somebody. The mind virus. Mm -hmm. My favorite. I've seen interrogators mess this up so much oh, yeah. because they actually bluff. And you can't bluff when you're doing it. No, and there's right. a thin line there, right? So people understand planting a mind virus is like saying, is there any reason somebody would have told me they saw you on that corner last night at 10 o'clock? Yeah. Okay, that's planting a mind virus. Bluffing is saying, One of the we neighbors. know, have you we, seen know. Yeah. we know you were. We know yeah. you were on that corner last night because a neighbor said so. If they weren't there, you've lost that's control right. of the interview. Yeah. You've lost all momentum now because you lied and you're caught in a lie. Remember, remember, interrogation is about approaches. It's about psychology and getting. And one of the levers we called we know all is we come in with a file. It looks like we know a bunch of stuff. And we would then claim to know something. And I would do exactly that. Is any reason you would have been on the corner of Boom Boom? And I would always teach my guys the number one failure mode is that last step you take too far. You go from we, all, yeah. we know all to we don't know. So even yeah. a folder, uh, just a a notebook or a folder full of random forensic looking documents that says DNA or traffic cameras or something like that on it. That folder in itself can sit there and just be a mind virus throughout the entire sure. interview. Yep. And one thing with the mind virus, I think it's important to set it up. So like if there's a murder in a neighborhood, I want to set this up really, uh, really carefully to where it has maximum power. So I'm going to say, uh, John, thanks for coming in today. I'm really glad you're here. We've got officers ever since last night canvassing the entire neighborhood, talking to every single person that they can, and they've got a ton of information that's just flooding in right now. Ring so I'm going to set it up there. Yep. Yeah, the ring yep. doorbell yep. camera videos. There's a ton of stuff coming in right now. And John, I do like you as a person, uh, but please, I, I want you to think very, very carefully before you answer this question. And then I'll throw the mind virus question out. And I think it's got a lot more punch. Oh when yeah, you, when you set it up, you have like to frame that. it. For we sure. we yeah. talk about that, and, and we we compare. It's like comparing motorcycles or cars, or anything else, about what we've got in our in our packets. I, I call it the thud factor. The louder that thing is, boy, the more power it has. Has because you walk in, boom, and you throw it on the thing, and they as they they may not see it right then, but they know something big is in there, and you'll just talk, and they'll see their name on this, and a yep. bunch of files in there. I had Burger King coupons in mine. Well, there, <laughs> at yeah, one yeah. point, well, it's and, taught all over the world. That, yeah. That, Technique is tall. And those little, even back when there were DVDs were big, I still got these. And you can just peel the tape off and then put whatever it is, their their full name, yep. first, middle, and last name, put it in that little pile too. It's bang, put it down on there and, and yep. wrap it in a little plastic and have it sitting there. And you don't have to say anything about it, but the, but they'll be they'll be looking at it. I don't ever put it in their reach where they can reach and get it, 
but they'll they'll look at it as you're talking to them and as as they're thinking yeah. you know they'll get loose from you and they'll just look at it and say, you'll get well, one of shit. these as they're talking like yeah i guess we uh we go over there i guess like every week or two and you'll see them just they see yeah. their name on there it's, it's really fun when you go out of the room and you leave they can't get to it you know they're cuffed or mm -hmm. whatever you leave it on the table and just watch them on the camera because you yeah, well, yeah. it's it's nope. crazy body language but the opposite end to that the kind of amateur end is is as you were saying bluffing with the specific because the more you go, hey, yes. well, John saw you on the street corner, they will go, well, jo John, John's an idiot. Like, who believes John? Yeah. Or he's out of the country, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah they, they, will, they will tear down your bluff very, very simply. But when you've got something that is kind of in the ether a little bit more, it's just hanging in the air, their brain is trying to do a whole bunch of calculations of what do you have? What can I destroy? Is it credible? Is it not credible? That really you've, you've, you've put their brain into be into too much cognitive load first of all yeah the value to me of asking that question is there any reason somebody would have told me they saw you there last night if they take five to seven seconds to answer that question oh right. yeah 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 right. you know. damn good chance they were on that <laughs> yeah. corner yeah. last night because they got to think security cameras neighbor mm -hmm. i heard a car go by Right. If they weren't there, they can say, yeah, that'd be really strange because I goddamn sure was not there. Yeah. Well, let's tie yeah. all this back together. You just did it. And when I ask you that question and you're you're talking about what they're doing in their head, watch your eyes. Your eyes are moving everywhere. Yeah. We're back to that original thing. Were you there at seven o'clock last night? Hell no, I wasn't there. Not, um, right. No, 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 I wasn't. So that yeah. eye movement is showing I mean, the I cognitive load. You can who lives see. Near there. Yeah. yeah, they're thinking of, okay, is it possible they could know that? And they're, they're evaluating. Right? They're running so many scenarios at the same time that then if you then jump in with a question you want to know the answer to, yep. and it's yeah. easy for them to answer, they'll just yes. blurt it out. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. a thing I call looking for change. When you get a person in a bind, and you do it all the time on your show, and you see them go down left, down right, down oh, left, down today. right. They're, you've got them patched because what they're doing is they're getting to an emotional state and thinking about what does that mean and that searching for change mindset, you've got them. And it's just so powerful when you so, go. Since we're on the podcast, today we were in the green room watching this and Dr. Phil, you've got somebody in just about pre-confession mode oh, yeah. where they're oh, almost yeah. at this perfect point of melting and all of us, like we were watching the Super Bowl. Yeah, we're, we're in the green room. Room. <laughs> You gotta go watch. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, next oh time we need popcorn. Yeah. We need popcorn. You got it. Because you had it right there. You had it right there, and you went like this. Anyway, well, you let her have the. Like, you let oh, her have the man. Her some space. It was beautiful. We yeah. Yeah. This is what I get into a lot in interrogation with her. I don't want to destroy her credibility. I'm wanting to determine whether she's lying about this specific thing or not yeah. without destroying her entire credibility because I want her to get him out of jail because I think she lied. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we agree. I believe yeah. she lied. So I want to establish her as a liar, but not destroy her as a credible witness. So there's a tightrope you're yes. having to walk. That's tough. That's really yeah. tough. And that's why I said... Tell me other lies you've told in your life. Yeah. I want to establish her as a gold star liar, but not as somebody that the judge would completely dismiss as being non-credible in any fashion whatsoever. And that's a tight rope to walk. Oh, yeah. yeah. You get a lot of drama, folks, on your show, and that you have to do a lot of that because you got to keep their life intact. Yeah. Yeah. And still get to the truth. And it's the, kind of crazy. The, I got a funny story to go with that video. The other day, and you guys, you two already know this one. So when we first got that video and you sent it over, I watched maybe the first <laughs> minute and a half, almost two minutes of it, it's like six minutes long. And I was like, I'm done with this. This she did, you know, she's being yeah. honest here. There's, yeah. there's yeah. nothing there. So I, I put it down, I you know, and I go upstairs and, you know, eat a bowl of cereal or something. Greg calls. I ain't got a minute. What are you doing? I said, Hey man, how's it going? He said, Did you watch that video? And I said, Well, I watched the first half. He said, Did you see the last half? And I said, last part I said, No. He goes, Oh, okay. Well, you need to watch the last half. And then he said, I got to go and hung up. And I was like, I missed it. I, 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 I totally saw this and whatever's down there, I missed it. I told it. And the whole, the entire day, I was, my wife was asking me, are you okay? What's going on? I was like, mind virus. Yeah. I was <laughs> like, I don't know. I, not intentionally. I'm okay. And I was rethinking every, what am I doing? Who am I? You know, what's happening here? Where are we? Why am I in my life? And then I watched it and I was like, yeah, I see. What, and he, I called him, what the hell are you talking about? 
yeah, I see this here. And he goes, yeah, it's something else. And I said, didn't you see all that, all that yeah. grief? And stuff? Yeah, and I was like, yeah, I did. And I, I said, no him. big deal. He's like, no, it is. I've been, I've been walking yeah. through. Oh, man. The yeah, target I just, today. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought, I've rethought Funny. everything. I thought coming here is just, uh, no, this is, I don't know what I'm talking to do. I was going to have a meeting and the whole thing. <laughs> you got to talk about this. I don't know what I'm doing. I had a guy in my training one time who didn't, he, he, we were, he was working with me. He didn't believe in mind viruses. He's like, you can't just, you those. can't do this. So the next okay. day, Later I called well. him at a time that I knew he it would go to voicemail. Mm. I said, hey, man, they released everything. They're putting everything out on the internet as we speak. Please call me back as soon as possible. And I didn't answer my phone the rest of the day. <laughs> Powerful. So that evening, he calls me, and he's like, dude, I can't find anything. I've called three private investigators. I'm having them search the internet. What are you talking about? Who's releasing? I was like, the Wall Street Journal. They're just putting out the news of the day. They're releasing everything with the news. What do you think I was talking about? Uh, I got to demonstrate it. It was so yeah, beautiful. I wish I recorded that yeah, stuff. That's but it's, it's so effective that we we default, like Mark always says, our, we're, it's more healthy and safe for us to totally. default to negative. Yeah. Pat Pattern right. sufficient well, data, we default to a negative. So if you, if you tell somebody something or give them some information and there is stuff missing, their brain won't go, oh, good, there's stuff missing. Well, that's a really yeah. good thing. I think we're all going to be safe. It goes, well, that's going to be a massive problem then, isn't it? And yeah. for some people, it will actually catastrophize. Yes. Yeah. So it'll go, the world is ending. And that's it'll the rock take and them. bear. Absolutely. That's the rock Absolutely. and bear. And go yeah. through that for a second. Yeah, so the rock and bear theory is if your ancestors thought uh, rocks or bears were rocks, they didn't reproduce. If your ancestors thought bears or, that rocks were bears, they were afraid, but they reproduced. So that's part of the problem is that we as human beings, and I don't mean millions of years, I'm talking thousands of years, if your family's too stupid to figure out that a bear is not a rock, they didn't keep going. Well, and that's, so, this, and that's so that's really a pattern important. finding thing in human yeah. beings too. Yeah. And the reason that's so important is that when you are reading body language, understand it can get quite confusing. There's a lot going on. And when we get confused, we default to negatives, not positives. So most of your life, you'll be walking around the planet. You'll see other human beings. They'll be doing stuff. Your instinct will go, I don't quite know what's going on here. But it doesn't look Let's good. make up a bad story, yeah. not a good story. Yeah. Now, it could be bad or it could be good. But one of the important things you've got to do is go, well, it could be bad. My instinct feels that it's bad, but I'm probably in quite a safe place at the moment. I could also presume it's good at the same time and find out a little bit more. Now, if you're in a really unsafe position, Go with your instinct that goes, yeah, this is really bad. Let's get the hell out of here. But if you're in a good position, you've got plenty of resource around you, you've got friends, you feel safe, then you can think a little more carefully about some of those instincts that you have. Susan Constantine, one of the world's leading authorities on body language. What I do is I analyze human behavior. So I'm watching different gestures and, and decoding those meanings and reading your facial expressions of emotions and try to understand what you might be thinking or feeling. And then combining that with your words, what are you saying? What is decoding those words and coming up with, you know, what does that actually mean behind those words? So it's kind of all encompassing. Well, let's talk about how people can use that every day. Cause you know, parents have kids, Wives have husbands, husbands have wives, people have bosses, they have co-workers. And what I like to do is give people information where if they listen to us, they listen to you and me here, then they have an edge that other people don't have. Let's give them some tools and things that they can use in their everyday life. People always say that 7% of all communication is nonverbal. That's true at the hello level. But of course, that goes down a lot as you get more data with words and everything. Now the words start to have more power. But still, nonverbals are a huge part of communication, right? Yes, they are. Because reading nonverbal cues is nothing more than your emotions being revealed through your nonverbal movements. So yeah. whatever you're thinking. And processing is going to be exhibited through your nonverbal cues, yeah, nonverbal people, movements. People used to ask me when I was at Courtroom Sciences, can I really read a jury and what they're thinking or feeling at a particular time? And I was like, of course. I mean, it's like they're screaming from the jury box. If you have nothing to do but sit there all day and watch these people and how they respond when the plaintiff's lawyer gets up, how they respond when the defendant's lawyer gets up, when a certain witness is on the stand, and you really read them, first you get a baseline, then you see how they depart from that baseline from different people. It's a st 
astounding how much information they give you. And then you debrief them after the trial and you find out if you were right or wrong. And they truly are screaming at you non-verbally from the jury box. So it is true. It is true. And the one thing you mentioned, everything is I'm totally in, in, in uh, sync with that because I also am a, a trial consultant and right. I watch juries. And also what's important mm. is in everyday life is that people are giving these cues off and then people are not picking them up and they're making decisions based on just what they're saying and they're not picking up on those little nuances that gave you such valuable information. And the words you find out that they're in opposition to what their body language was saying. So, so body language, in my opinion, is key to communication. Why do you think some people just don't read the room? People that are maybe talking at dinner or going to a party or something, you see them talking and they just don't read the room. People are rolling their eyes, they're looking for the bathroom. It's like, how do I get away from this? <laughs> and they don't get it. Seriously, how do people not read the room? Yeah, in fact, I was having a conversation with a gentleman that was just in here. We're talking about most people don't realize is that communication is a lot like volleying a ball back and forth playing tennis, which is your yeah. favorite sport. So. Communication goes back and forth and back and forth and then all you're doing is listening to uh, uh, this boring person and not picking up that their eyes are rolling back in their head and it's because they're thinking about something else. They're not tuned in and you know what I find is that especially with social media today that they're not focused on face-to-face -face communication. They're right. down like this all the time. So We're getting lazy at it, right? Yes, getting very lazy yeah. at it. If you could tell somebody how to read the room. It should be obvious if people are losing their audience. Are they that narcissistic? Yeah, that's what exactly what it is. And there's also people that are just attention seekers, right? So they're types of personalities that just, they feed off from all of that excitement. All the attention's gotta be on me. Listen to me, because I am so self-important. I have so many important things to say, and then everybody should listen. And they're not noticing that when people are standing around in a circle, that their angles of their body are already faced towards <laughs> the exit sign, or they want to go out the door, right? Yeah. And their faces have become very flat, or they've got that very phony, artificial smile that they're trying to be cordial and shaking their head, yeah. yet they're, they're looking, about, looking around the room just trying to figure out a way to exit out. What do you think are the minimal encouragers that people should look for to tell whether somebody's really interested in what they're talking about? If somebody's really interested in what they're talking about is they're leaning forward and they have their head tilted and they're mm -hmm. bobbing their head two or three times like, yes, I hear you. Mm -hmm. And they're making really good direct eye contact. It's not a stare, but you find that when people are really interested, mm -hmm. they're leaning in. They're tilting their head. They're in this active listening position. Their body language, their, their, their body language is tilted forward. So they're moving in towards your proximity, into your space because they want more. If they're leaning back or to the side, they're not. If they're leaning to the side, they may be analyzing. If they're leaning back, they're completely disinterested. And you might have noticed the same thing when you're uh, in, in jury selection, right? People that are kind of leaning back and they're analyzing, they're just trying to figure out what's <clears throat> everything's going on. If they're leaning back, you've completely lost them. So facial expressions, we know that movements uh, and within their facial expression are universal compared to millions of other faces across the entire world. Now we're talking about body language. It's not multicultural, it's cultural. So that lean in could be someone that in right. the, within that culture that's considered being their norm. Uh, in certain pr parts of the country and uh, Asian countries, mm -hmm. you know, that they're more close in proxemics. Others are further away. Uh, looking mm -hmm. at someone in the eye would offend a certain culture. Certain gestures right. also are very off-putting. Let me see what you think about this. You've done this because you do jury work, but when I prepare witnesses, I always try to teach a witness this, and I don't have the research in my head anymore. Maybe you do, and if you do, maybe you'll send them to me. But I always quoted the research that as sad as it is, we tend to like people that like us. And that's common sense, right? We like people that like us. We don't like people that reject us. We like people that accept us because our number one need in life is acceptance. Our number one fear is rejection. So we like people that like us. And we believe people we like. If we like somebody, we give them the benefit of the doubt. We want to believe them. So we believe people that we like, and we like people that like us. 
So that follows that we believe people that like us. Now that means, okay, hang on, there's <laughs> another dot to this. That means if we're a good audience, we're going to be believed. What happens is that we're sending messages. So there's a sending and receiving of messages going back and forth. And people, even the untrained person, is trying to decode what you're, what you're actually saying through your nonverbals. And they're also, what they're doing is they're, they're watching those nonverbals and they're also connecting it to someone that they might remember that looked like that. Yeah, that's a good point, right? It is, and so they start to project, like that woman's voice reminds me of my ex-wife, I don't like her, and they automatically taint them, it's not likable. But likability is really important, as you know, like even with attorneys, I mean, attorneys can shift how jurors feel about their client just based on their own presentation of themselves, their facial expressions, how they look at the jury, their tone that they use, their facial expressions, their grimaces, all of that plays into how people perceive you. And you're right, people are gonna judge you from the minute they set eyes on you. And it's gonna be very hard for them to be able to walk away from that and think differently. You have to prove it to them that you're different. And when I'm training people in my courses is that even with mediators and attorneys and say your outcome of that verdict is a direct reflection of how well you communicate with other people. Mm -hmm. So if you've got this grimace look on you, even that concentration can look like a meanness or someone that's angry and it could be concentration. People might misread that because the average person doesn't know how to actually decode body language accurately. They're just labeling those gestures to something they're familiar with. For example, one of the things I ask people is like, uh, at the very beginning of my training classes, is how many of you are feel like you're really good at like reading a liar or reading people? And they'll raise their, oh, I'm really good. I said, well, the research has found that the reason why you're able to pick up those clues is because you're a pretty good liar yourself. <laughs> because exactly. you can pick up on things that you've actually used in the past and that's why you can see it in other people and then recognize it. Right. If we're telling people how to connect and bond, you said eye contact and we're not talking about the hundred yard stare. We're talking about... Right, the creepy one. Yeah. You're talking about relaxed but consistent eye contact. Right leaning in, nodding along and giving the minimal encouragers, you become a good audience. Yes. And that makes you bond. That helps people feel comfortable with you. It does. They feel acceptance. So they're going to yes. like you. And what I'm saying is they like you, they're going to believe you. That is absolutely true. They will believe you because people trust people that they like. That's mm -hmm. just the, the natural reaction. How, you know, when you think about in sales and they mentioned the person you bought the car for, they'll say, hey, go down there and go see my buddy. He's really a great guy. I really like him. Well, what they're really saying is that he gave me a good deal, but you know that connection that I had with them mm -hmm. makes me feel like I want to trust them. Yeah. There's also danger in that, though, too, from the opposite end, because people that are perpetrators that really hone in on uh, people to take advantage of them bank on that. So they know that those charming techniques, those rapport building skills that they've learned in classes that they come to, like myself, my clerk, I mean, my classes that they come to, uh, that I teach, that by using those techniques that I've trained, they can actually use it in a negative way too. Yeah, because I've always said, I think you can trust people, or at least my formula is, I trust people as much as I trust myself to be able to deal with whatever they do. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be perfect. If I trust myself enough to deal with your flaws and fallacies, then I can trust you. If I'm so fragile that you have to be perfect, then I can't trust you very much. But if I trust myself to be like, you don't have to be perfect, you make a mistake, you say something that maybe hurts my feelings or you make a misstatement or whatever, if I trust myself enough to be resilient, to come back from that, to filter out something that's said wrong or even misrepresented, then I don't have to go through life with sweaty palms. No. If I trust myself to be discerning enough, then 
I don't have to go through life scared. You got to trust yourself first. Then you don't have to be so worried about what somebody else does. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, even, you know, I think about that's important for even our kids to know, right? Our, yeah. our teenagers to be able to say, hey, I want to trust in themselves and not try to become, mm -hmm. we talked about this uh, earlier today uh, in conversation, is that oftentimes what people do, even in business, they, they act out what they think that their boss may want them to be like. So become more assertive, uh, be more powerful, be more commanding. Um, and then they get off, off of their own natural gifts, right? Yeah. They, they get outside of their own gifts and talents and they now become mm -hmm. another person's identity. So you have to trust who you are, embrace who you are, embrace your own natural gifts. And I hate the word so much as authentic, but just be okay with who you are and accept it and when you get to that place, then your nonverbals will fall in place. If you're feeling confident within yourself, your nonverbals will be confident. Yeah. If you're feeling shy and introverted, your nonverbals will look shy and introverted. So it's all here first, and, and you're psychologically, what you think and feel is gonna be projected outside. Yeah, I always talked about it as being congruent. If all your nonverbals are congruent with what you're saying, mm -hmm. then it's just smooth. People read you right. They just seem like, you know, she just seems real to me. Because mm -hmm. everything she says just clicks with everything she seems to be. I mean, it just all clicks. Yes. The way she presents, everything just seems to go. And I think if you're around somebody that's not congruent, it's just like music that's offbeat. It just doesn't Boy. get your ear right. It is exactly, and, and things are not fitting right. You know, when you're around somebody and going, you know, it's just something's not fitting. And that's really should be looked at anything from across the board. Things that don't fit together, well, if there's a reason for it. If there's discord or disconnect, there's because yeah. there is a disconnect.